Now, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria says Nigeria should expect more items on its FX restriction list. I have Sam Chilopai here, he's the Managing Director and CEO of Kairos Capital. He joins me to discuss this and some other stories making the rounds here in Nigeria. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Sam. Thank you for having me. All right, then, let me pick your brain on this FX ban and more lists to come. When you hear this, this kind of signaling coming from the Central Bank, we've had the recent one on milk. We've had an exhausting debate on, you know, backward integration and getting all of that in. And we were seeing that this is going to stretch to other sectors in due course, according to the Central Bank. What's your take on this? So, from what we hear, it looks like it's basically focused on food items. At least judging from what the president said, and then the central bank governor coming forward to buttress the position of the president. In my view, it should have been the other way around. It should have been the CBN making that kind of pronouncement since they are autonomous and independent, and they ought, not, and they ought to make such pronouncements from the CBN and not from um, the presidency as it came. But be that as it may, what the CBN has done is to have some 41 items on the list of items that can get FX from the central bank or from banks for importation, and now they're going to increase that. So the key question becomes, the things you're going to add on the list, are they items that we're already sufficient in? What are we really sufficient in? What are we able to produce to the quantum that we're able to consume, bearing in mind our huge population? So you've got to balance it. It's a good decision, if you look at it, and, you know, to say, why spend FX to import products that can be produced here? So holistically, it's a good decision. But you know, the devil is always in the details. So which items are you going to ban? Are we able to provide them? And even when you ban getting FX from the central bank and from banks, people still have access to the other alternative markets to get FX to import those things. So what will happen is that price will go up. When price goes up, what will happen? Inflation will go up. All right, I hear you when you say that because really, at the end, as, as you said, the devil is in the detail. But I would like to get into something, another story, in fact, because from the, from the, the conversation the central bank had with correspondents yesterday, he, he, he kind of touched on quite a number of things, and I'd like to see as much as what, what we can get out of that conversation. You know, he also mentioned about um, the CBN defending the reserves. Uh, he was talking about the, the, um, the, the PNID ruling from the UK court there, and I'd like to get a thought on that case and, you know, how the CBN is going to go about this. So, I, I mean, this is a case of when it rains, it pours. So for the central bank, they're managing the fact that you've had decline in price of oil. Um, good news today, that price is beginning to inch up to somewhere close to $60 because the tension between the U.S. and China is beginning to ease up. That's good news for Nigeria, and we're happy to hear that. Um, but you have, when you have reduction in your key income earner, being price of crude, then you're not able to accumulate as much as you can into the, into the foreign reserves. What will actually happen is that you spend most of the foreign reserve defending the Naira. And you've seen in recent, recent reports, we've spent, say, somewhere around, we've gone down by around 400 million US in foreign reserve figures because the CBN is spending that to ensure that the Naira trades at, um, at, at around the price that they're expected to trade against the dollar. Now you have this judgment debt. This is 9 billion US dollars. That's about 20% of our foreign reserve. Can we pay it and still remain, uh, and we're still able to trade our currency at the price? Can we pay it and then we're still able to maintain the kind of growth we project for our economy? I think the answer is no. Mm. Um, so it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be cool to see how, it'll be good to see how the CBN intends to manage this. This mm. judgment debt, $9 billion, is a lot of money. Yeah, because it's good, it's good to get clarification. For, well, first, they say they're going to exhaust all avenues to appeal the case. And we'll see how that goes. So I think we just still have to hold our horses a little on that one and see yes. how, how it plays out. But then another story, which is still linked, and I'll um, still talk about it because it's still an oil story at the end mm -hmm. of the day. We're hearing the, the FIS chairman's response um, to, to the, qu the query that was uh, given to him by the, the, the presidency of office. And then he's talking about the fact that the oil price volatility and the recession were some of the key components on why there were some um, um, discrepancies in in what was what was the, the target the, the, for, for revenues and what was actually collected. So I think this is a situation where um, it's, it's a conflict between the, what we've been hearing in the press and what it's actual. So if you trace back a couple of few couple of years, maybe in the last 18 months, 24 months, thereabouts, the news coming out of FIRS. Now the question is, uh, to what extent was that news really coming out of FIRS? Was a question of growth in the tax net. 
that numbers were increasing. I, I remember I saw figures around 20 million now in the tax net. Mm. It, was a, it was numbers being bandied to show that we're making more revenue from the non-oil sector and generally from taxation. But now that the chicken has come to roost, when you're comparing actual versus another time, uh, another three years period spanning the same time, it doesn't seem to pan out that way. Yes, I saw his defense, and his defense was that we've grown the non-oil sector in terms of tax coming from the non-oil sector. Mm -hmm. While well, that is good, but remember, what the government needs is money to fund huge budget deficits. So even if you've grown the non-oil sector, well, kudos to that. But total, have you grown what comes in revenue from tax? If you haven't achieved that, then probably you haven't achieved your budget and your, and your key performance indicator as, um, as head of FIRS. So clearly something, there needs to be an alignment between what is expected and what is actual. In terms of the figures we're seeing today, we're making less from tax returns, regardless of what the situation is. And even if you begin to adjust the numbers for inflation, it will yet even be lower. So clearly there need, a lot more needs to be done in terms of people in the tax net. A lot more needs to be done in terms of the growth of the economy. As the economy grows, people make more money, then they can pay more tax. Now, if you're an economy that is not growing, that you're growing at less than 2%, where are you going to get the tax from? All right, then. Let me get into another part of this conversation, more or less now looking at it from the, the um, presidential, the two-day retreat the president is having for the ministers designate. We understand that tomorrow they're going to get their inauguration, is going to go out, and then we'll finally get to know what their portfolios are going to be, and then we can make a sound judgment on who's mm -hmm. the best fit, who's the square peg in, mm -hmm. in the square hole, and, and all of that. But then, uh, first, um, one something coming from that from that yesterday. Yesterday, the, the 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 vice president made a presentation, and in there, he was pointing to the fact that we're uh, was warning more or less of the fact that there's going to be a, there's a looming fiscal crisis mm -hmm. in the works, and he's still linked to this story on on, yes. on tax that we we're talking about here. Uh, from your point of view, though, how do you how do you see this? And also comment first on the on the minister's cop coming in, in, into, into office and also on this looming fiscal crisis? Well, for the ministers coming in, well, it's, um, it's good news. Um, I think it's taken too long. Um, we could have had the same ministers have their portfolios and run. Uh, I mean, the government should know four years is not a long time. Um, so we're finally, we are, we are having the ministers getting their portfolio tomorrow. That would be good. I hope that they just... Um, start running, in, in fact, start flying from day one because they haven't got a lot of time um, to achieve whatever thing they want to do. Remember that these ministers didn't contribute to this budget. So you're going to have a circle, a budget circle, that they didn't contribute to um, what projects was critical. And then they're going to go enter another circle. So you have a, there's going to be a log between what they plan to do and what they can't do. Interesting, because this time around, we hear the president is going to be monitoring their performance because it's part of the things he mentioned while, while, while he was talking about the ministers the last time. That goes without saying. That's, the box stops at the president's table. The president ought to be monitoring the performance of his ministers. That's his job. That's, his, that's why he's paid. It's his job. He's the CEO here. And it's his job to make sure that the ministers are performing. I'm hopeful that in this second term, any minister that is not cutting it is asked to vacate that uh, um, the, the minister's leak. You can't be a minister, and because you're appointed a minister, you'll be there for four years, automatic employment, and, and nothing like that. I think that in this second term, the president must hold the bull by the horn and make sure that any minister who's not cutting it is asked to leave. The vice president mentioned the issue of fiscal, um, basic, some fis looming um, fiscal Crisis. issues that we're, we're about to have. I'd say that we've been in it for a while. We've had deficit budget. We've had a situation last year where the total revenue from the government could hardly fund the recurrent expenditure, how much more the capital. And the same thing is happening again. So the, the fact about fiscal crisis, revenue side, rising debt stock, deficit budget, all indicators to a fiscal crisis has been with us for a while. It just didn't happen. What I'd like to see is what is the plan to get us out of it? Mm. How do we hope to get out of this fiscal crisis? Um, I think that already the budget benchmark, in my view, is too high considering what's happening. But hey, I'm just wondering, we need to hear from government, how do we get out of this? Whether we have a fiscal crisis, mm. yeah, it's certain it's here with us. All right, then. F finally, just want to touch on these last two stories here. One, for one of them bothering the fact that we're hearing this news coming in, talking about the EFCT rating, the um, 
FAA residents of the former Lagos State Governor, Kim Umian Body. And also another story linked to that, that was since um, security agencies sealing off a venue where uh, a symposium around insecurity was supposed to happen yesterday, which was making news on Twitter and on, on, on social media platforms. So maybe I should go with the second one first. Yeah. Um, I think that one, I'm, I'm a strong proponent for uh, the rule of law and the rights of people. And I believe that people should have the rights to express themselves. So if people want to gather and talk, by all means, let them talk. What the security agents can do is to ensure there's no breakdown of law and order and to make sure that miscreants do not use the opportunity for a breakdown of law and order. I'll never support any acts of violence. You can protest, but protest within the boundaries of the law. So if people wanted to gather and talk, I, I, think, I don't think that the police had the right to go there and stop them from talking. Mm -hmm. They're just going to talk. Um, they're not carrying weapons. They're not, it was not a protest. It wasn't a street march that you could say people to, could take advantage of it. It was a particular venue. The speakers are known. They were going to speak. I think they should have been allowed to speak. On the issue with the former governor, it's been brewing. We read in the press that there was about 4 billion naira um, thereabouts that was moved in different accounts and all of that. Once the EFCC is investigating to find out what the true issues are, then that's very fine. What we should have is a case where you investigate. It doesn't matter how long it takes. Make sure you have a watertight case before you charge the person to court. That you do what I call media trial. And then when you get to court and there's no substance to it, it doesn't bode well for us. They should investigate the matter. If there are questions for the former governor to answer, he should answer. If he needs to be charged to court, he should be charged to court. He can defend himself, get his lawyers, and the court, his day in court will come. Rule of law, that's my position.